Put down a hammer, down a hammer, and pick up the pencil. You're about to listen to the Savvy Radio Show, yeah. Real estate info galore. So listen up, don't miss it. Hosted by the Savvy Landlord. Oh. Friends, yes, I, I called you a friend because you just tuned in to the radio show, the Savvy Radio Show. My name is Steve Van Kellenberg. I am the Savvy Landlord. And I have been waiting for this day for a long time, probably since May of 2000, whenever I started this thing, 300 episodes ago, I have been trying to get this guy on the radio show. Half the time, I don't know if he's being serious when he denies me. It's almost like when I was dating my wife and she would blow me off like six months, like, no, I'm busy, I'm in school. She would set up a date and then cancel on me. This gentleman would just straight up and say, no, nope. I mean, like without even without even just like I'm like, can you just think about it? And I don't know if it's his job because he's a big time banker or he's like, I'm a peon in the scheme of things. But this is probably one of the closest friends I have in uh, both spiritually, physically, emotionally industry wise. I mean, this is my counsel, my banker my friend, a family confidant, man, I, I don't know. I don't even know if I should mention where you work at. I, I'm so insecure and nervous how to bring <laughs> you to, to you to the table. But this guy, this is, this is, I, I begged him. He, at first he said no. When I interviewed him just over the weekend, I was like, bro, I need you to get you on the radio to promote investor weekend. And he said, no, I mean, I gotta, I'll print these effing emails out. Cause it was like within 30 <laughs> seconds, you said no. And then I said, listen, it's 10 minutes. I just need you to talk about what you're going to bring to the table on Saturday. Can I, can I, can I, can I tell you what, what happened then? Okay. Okay. All of a sudden, hi, hello world. Move up, move in, move in a little bit closer okay. to the microphone. All of a sudden what happened was I'm, I'm in my study at the house and I'm working and that dead gum uh, song, what's her name? Marion Hill, that art, that are you down song came in. Yeah. Was are, you plan? Down? are you down? Are you down? And I'm like, hey, I'm feeling jiggy. Let's just call Steve. Let's email. Let's email Steve back and say, I'm down. Let's do. The, let's do the That's interview. Awesome. That's all it was. Whatever it takes. That was the epiphany. Some okay. So go ahead. Out there in a music world. Anyway, so this is John Day, uh, executive, whatever the freak you are at First Security Bank. <laughs> um, let me tell you how I met this guy. So about four or five years ago, maybe five, six, I've been having a relationship with this bank called First Security Bank. And that banker groomed me extremely well and just said, one day I'm not going to be here. And I was like, no, you're not. Cause I, you know, and then one day he disappeared. <laughs> he, he just <laughs> poof. And so I was like, oh man, there goes all everything I've ever done. And then all of a sudden this young, uh, savvy banker, there you w- go. which we're going to get back into Keep here going. in a minute. Keep going. Uh, said, let's do lunch. I'm like, I've never had a banker say, let's do lunch. First of all, I was so scared. I remember you called me and I, I, I had a t-shirt on uh-huh. and I was like, I had to run home and go get a long sleeve shirt. Cause you know, I have a tattoo and I did not want, <laughs> I did not want you to Wait. Per- perceive me. Wait, you have a tattoo? I have Steven? a tattoo. I've been wearing long oh, sleeve every time no. I've seen you. Oh no, it's over. And, um, I'm calling cause nuts. I didn't know who you were. You're just a shirt to me with a collar and a tie. Can I, can I make a phone call right now? Can you just put this on? Please call the, <laughs> so, so anyway, that's how I first met him. And, uh, I can contribute probably 90%, 99% of my success was the day that we had lunch together. Boom. Nine, you heard it here first folks. So I said, <laughs> he, you asked me this simple question. What are you doing today? And I said, well, I'm going to go look at this apartment building but I don't think I'm going to buy it. And you're like, well, let me go look at it. And so he was a, you know, my first meeting with this guy. And I was like, okay. So I ran out to the truck, pick out this flyer. It was a flyer from the, from the flyer box in front of the property. And I just had all these notes, chicken stretch. I even, I even called my mom on my way to this lunch saying about this apartment. Cause she's the one that actually found the apartment for me. She found the sign. Wow. Really? And told I me about know. it. And I was telling her, no, I'm not going to buy it. It doesn't cash flow. This ain't going to work. No way. And I can't, aff- my mind was just self-defeating. I can't afford it. It was out of my zip code. And it, and that was the defining moment, Mr. Day, that you, uh, believed in me that said I would loan on this. And I was like, who is this guy? You had, you had a flyer with you. I had a flyer. You? Uh-huh. And I, and I had script, you know, and I don't, really, I don't think I said I didn't think I was going to buy it. Mm-hmm. And you said I would loan on this. And so when you said that, it changed my whole perspective 
maybe I should rerun the numbers. And long story short, you uh, loaned me the money. It would actually was the quickest loan that I had at that time was five days that you closed that deal. Okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I don't think you remember. This is 2011. Oh, I remember the loan. I absolutely remember So I guess I've known you for over six, seven years. So yeah. anyway, this is 2011. Anyway, you closed the deal. That has been my, probably my jewel. We call that property the legacy property. But that's enough of me. So John, Mr. Yeah. Day, what is your title at the bank? I am. I serve the bank in a lot of different capacities. My formal title there is Senior Vice President. I do a lot of our lending there at the bank, uh, but I'm also on the board of directors. Uh, last April of 16, I'm doing the math in my head because cool. I'm bad with time. So, board of directors. Board of directors. What, what do you do? What, what do you do on a board of directors? Well, the board of directors is, is the governing body of the church of the church. <laughs> I'm working on a church loan. I'm working on two church loans oh, okay. right now. Okay, so I'm like, is uh, Jesus going to show up? Here Jesus is going to show up. Let's I'm put, like, okay, let's so you some, you're on a board. Yes, is this the uh-huh. thing that they how they the underwriting process where you approve people through this board? It's different from bank to bank, but on our board basically is the governing body of the bank. The officers of the bank. The president, the CEO of the bank, report mm-hmm. to the board of directors. The other officers of the bank report first to the president of the bank and then to the board of directors. The board of directors are responsible. They have what's called a fiduciary responsibility for the bank. So if the bank should ever break any laws, if the bank should ever get in trouble, it's the board of directors um, that, steps in that well they they get they better step in or they get drug they get they get invited in a very non-negotiable way into the process by the uh, banking regulators and they're, state they're accountable or they're, oh you bet big time well so that's a big honor to have that it's stature huge. on your a resume and just huge. your what you have to do so what's your daily operations there at the bank what do you do you know i spend you know, 90% of my time most days working with real estate investors in one capacity or another. Okay. And that's by doing underwriting and connecting and doing all and writing loans? The whole bit from soup to nuts. I answer a lot of questions. I spend a lot of time. Um, you know, some would say more time than I should on in one-on-one conversations with investors. But most of the investors that I work with are guys and gals that are just getting started and they're nervous. Sure. They're nervous about a lot about the whole process because despite, you know, what a tremendous resource that the Savvy Radio Show is and the other it is. I mean, well, every, I appreciate that. everybody out there in Savvy Savvy Radio Show land is going, "Yes, it is a great resource." Despite everything you can learn, there is so much to begin to learn. There's probably 12 or 13 different building blocks to do this right and getting the money for many people is the most intimidating part talking to somebody at a bank is the most intimidating part mm. of that other than you know writing a check out of your own account to put something well, because you were a tie it is it's the tie it's the bank culture you know and so you know the only way that i know to combat that is to become as much of a real person to people as i can and that just takes time absolutely you know? it just takes time so why I got so many questions going through my mind, but why is your bank so real estate strong or heavy? I mean, that is, I think, the bulk of your business. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's your passion, and we're going to get into how you got there, uh, your background in real estate. But why is First Security Bank so driven on real estate? You know, I, I, I don't want to try to oversimplify it, but I'm going to boil it down to two elements, Stephen. And I think that these elements will apply to just about, well, almost all the business ventures um, that I can think of. There's two reasons why we're real estate heavy. One is hard work, mm. but predominantly we're this heavy in real estate because we were lucky. And I'll tell you why we were lucky. Hmm, interesting. I came to the bank in August of 2010. Okay. Okay. 2000, so seven. 2010. Seven. So about six and a half years ago. 2010, Oklahoma City was just only then beginning to hit the bottom of all of the uh, the foreclosures. Just 
all of the B, C, D, F grade properties were really experiencing a lot of distress. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to have probably two or three real estate investors, they're already existing customers there at the bank. Oh, that's me. At Bingo. Okay. And so, <laughs> but, and the people that I was working with were people, I mean, again, I was lucky because one, you were, you were not a small investor at the time. You had a circle of friends, right. but there was also another group that I had the ability to do some work with that also were not small investors. There were two or three groups of investors. Um, that had also large groups of friends. And so I just approached, it was dumb luck. One, timing was perfect because in 2010 and 11, you could pick up, you know, deals in Oklahoma City, 30, 40, 50 cents on the dollar. Right. You know, now obviously anybody who's in the market realizes it's a lot harder than that. Mm -hmm. But back then, I mean, you could scoop them up in a basket. Sure. Okay. So deals I, were everywhere. They were everywhere. And... So I was in a situation, I was coming out of a job, and we can talk about that a little bit later, whenever you want. But I was coming out of a job where I was a lot more creative than most bankers were. I was a lot more innovative. Than, and willing than to meet. I think that's important yeah, too. I was, willing to, I, I was willing to start with people who had very, very little. You were not in that category. You had a lot less then than you do now. Sure. But I was, I mean, I was taking all, 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 all comers. And if we and you do that today. I noticed that. I talked to I young do. investors and... You spend a lot of great time with them. I do, you know, and so, but anyway, so the reason why we're so heavy is because the timing was right. And I also, you know, was lucky enough to have a couple of really pretty significant real estate investors, already customers of, of the bank. I began to take good care of them and they told six friends and they told six friends. Cool. And then I've been behind for sure. the last four, six years. Which is a great thing years. for bankers. You know, studying under you and uh, just other bankers, you know, I never thought of it as a sales job. I mean, your job is to get loans. You, us as in real estate investors, it's like the lottery. Oh my gosh, we can get a loan. We can buy this asset. Yeah. We're so excited. But on the flip side, I'm, I'm trying to teach young investors. They need to loan money. That's their job as a banker. Mm -hmm. They have to loan, make loans because they make origination fees that pay for their bills. And then they make the interest and they borrow money from the Fed and they loan it to you. Or some people have their own you know, assets that you guys loan off of your own banking. And that's another interview on another time. So how'd you fall in love with banking? Has it been your passion since you were in college? I know you've been to college. You've went to banker school, which is kind of really uh, an yeah. honor. Yeah. Do you have a dissertation for that? Like, is it like Mr. John Day slash BB <laughs> bad boy banker? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I don't think I ever want anybody to call me that. But um, oh, man, no, I want to put it on my application. <laughs> BBB, <laughs> BBB, bad boy, J JD, the BBB. Okay, no, I here's the. Um, I would never thought about being a banker, and really? actually, there's so many times that I have miscounted the cash in my own pocket that I thought, man, I could never be a banker. They'll never give me the job. How about playing Monopoly? Did you ever play? Were you ever the banker in Monopoly when you were growing up? Yeah, I did. I did, and you know those games were always way too long when I was young. I was ready to go back and play some Space Invaders on my Atari or something like that. It's like, what's with all this? There's nothing anyway. But no, what happened was I was working at a a small private equity firm um, for a real strong mentor of mine, and I had an opportunity to make a change to come into banking, and I took it, and um, it was a world change. I'd never, never, never thought about going into banking, but I had a mutual friend. Uh, in banking. Actually, I'd met the existing job. He was kind of the bridge, and he's the reason why I'm in banking. Um, and it's been a was a great fit almost immediately. And again, the rest of it was just kind of hustle and, and good luck. And cool. um, But yeah, the bank has been incredibly generous to me. They've uh, really created a home for me there. Mm -hmm. They immediately began to put me through a series of courses here locally through our Oklahoma Bankers Association. They do a fantastic job. Janice Reeser is over the education department there at Oklahoma Bankers Association. And she and her team, <clears throat> uh, Nancy and um, uh, the other people on, on her staff, they just do a fantastic job equipping Oklahoma bankers, and these are community bankers. These are not your big. So was it like an undergrad kind of department, or no? Like it was you... more like kind of a continuing ed education. Um, you would, these classes through the Oklahoma Bankers Association, you're not you're not required to have 
Hmm. Even a GED. I mean, the truth is, is that you know all bankers are trying to be better. <clears throat> In sure. fact, the Oklahoma Bankers Association, their motto is making bankers better. And so wherever you are, they have a whole course load of classes everywhere from uh, from the operations side to the loan side to the confidentiality side to the bank security side to the cybersecurity classes to underwriting loan documents to um, operation school to regulatory compliance classes. It just goes on and on. And so anyway, our bank put me through a whole series of those classes. And then you had mentioned banker school. I am a graduate of the graduate school of banking in Colorado. Cool. And so yeah, what is that? A, is that like a, what does that do for you? Is that just brought you to like the master level of banking or it makes me pretty much the best banker in the world. Actually sure. is what this does. It, no, it does not. What it does, it's what, um, but it's like a it's like a it's, graduate it's, program. It, it kind is. Of? It, it's not kind of. It is a graduate program, but it is within different industries. They have schools and certifications within that industry that are applicable in that industry, but are not really recognized outside that industry. You know, so if I was going to go into construction, sure. They really wouldn't care that I was a graduate of the Graduate School of Banking in Colorado because why would they care? Now, if I had gone through construction science, say at OSU or OU right. or someplace like that, and I had a, a master's in that, then that would be suitable to their in industry. So basically, I have a graduate level certification in the banking industry cool. because our board of directors you know, invested in me. That's awesome. To go Congratulations. That. Well, thank you. It was a fantastic time, and I learned a lot, and I loved it. Cool. It's a great school. So you're passionate about teaching. Your wife is a teacher right now, right? Yeah. She's te uh -huh. been teaching for how long? Uh, gosh. Since well, she graduated high school, college. I mean. Well, we've been married 25 years, so she's been teaching at least me for 25 years. And uh, But no, she's been in the classroom, I guess, now for seven years. She only this last year made the, made the switch to administration. And so she's working oh, okay. closely in the education world. And So is that just a desire for, you, for your guys' family because you, I mean, you're, you, you've taught me a lot, folks. You guys don't know that I've had a lot of lunches with this gentleman, and he has taught me Ibadaba and all these. Obviously, have not taught you Ibadaba, E D B I A, whatever the <laughs> F it is, uh, financial statement uh, savviness and balance sheet and all these things that you held my hand, which I was very insecure about because I had a large portfolio and I still did not understand. Um, these terminologies and, right. and, and I've definitely learned ratios and debt ratios. And you some might, some might say you might still be in the process of learning. Some Absolutely. Of okay. I don't, okay. that's why I have you on the radio. The more I'll learn something <laughs> from you. And that's why I I'm, I'm honored that you're going to come speak at investor. Yeah, Weekend. I am really but stoked. Like I just, that. I want to give these folks a, an idea that, that sure. you're passionate about teaching and where did that come from? Is oh, that like, that came from my folks. You know, it just comes right. from my folks. And, and they're teachers. And it came, you know, here's the thing. Everybody that is, you know, a W-2 employee, if you're not self-employed, you probably have taken a job sometime in your life and they said, oh, don't worry, we're going to teach you how to do this. Mm, they don't. And they don't. And it's mm -hmm. like, here's a book or here's your desk and there's your computer. Figure it out. That, that's into, you know, your training program. And how just grossly unfair that is. And so one of the things that I've realized is that, shoot, I mean, everybody wants to do a good job at whatever they're doing. Mm, true. And I believe because of what the, the wisdom and the knowledge and the brain that we're endowed with from our creator, that we have the ability to learn. If somebody will find our frequency and speak to us on that frequency, sure. that there is a hunger to grow, hunger to learn, hunger to better ourselves for, just for our own sake and self-worth, to make money, to provide for our family, mm -hmm. and to hit any kind of degree of success that you're hungry for or however you define success in your life. And mostly I think that begins with investing in yourself and having somebody, if you don't know the answers, either point to where the answers are or are helping you see things that you can't see on your own yet. Cool. So you've, you've been ingrained in this and then you, you came across that they're not teaching you financial education in school. When did you realize that, that was the case. Like I, I remember standing at OBU writing my first check at the <clears throat> in the bookstore for my books and I didn't know how to write a check. I mean I the really? lady behind the F encounter was like, You you forgot the to write out the number. <laughs> like right. 
three hundred. Well, oh, T H R E E. How do you spell hundred? H U N D R E. I remember nineteen ninety two. Well, back then, kids, you couldn't Google that up either. Like you couldn't like that, punch up YouTube. True. How do I write a check? I mean, do you, and you that girl schooled own. me at the counter. I mean, really? I got my first checkbook and I got my first wow. my first books and. And it was really, that was a defining moment for me in 1992 was like, man, I'm illiterate about, and I, sure. I hated check registry. Well, I think two things happened in my life. One, you know, I I don't want to speak a whole lot about this, but I mean, because it's not a big part of our story. It's a big part of my life. It's like my wife and I didn't have a whole lot when we, when we first got married. Like mm. all three of my kids were born with some type of state assistance because we just didn't make a whole lot. Cool. Like we can remember having to save up money to get haircuts. We mm. can remember having to put three dollars of gas in the car at a time. And you live in an apartment. We lived in an apartment, and we're happy to live in an apartment. Mm. Um, my first job in real estate was leasing apartments at Rockwell Plaza. And you for, got whooped on it for you? Oklahoma. Oh man, it was rough. Rockwell Plaza for your Oklahoma City peeps. <laughs> that's out at Rockwell and Wilshire, just south of uh, uh-huh. Northwest Expressway. It wasn't that bad. It is now. It is now. Okay. Uh, well, anyway, it, but that's what I did. And so, but the first thing you realize about money, unless your folks or somebody teaches you early how to manage it, you realize pretty fast that you have no idea what you're doing with it. And then that first kid or two comes, and you realize you really don't know what what you're doing. That's the first realization is that, oh, no, we're out of money, and what are we going to do to get more, and we're oh, we're upside down. So, honestly, you know, we got into some credit card trouble, and we had to deal with a lot of that. We realized, what are we going to do and all that. And so you have to sit down, and you have to search your soul, and you realize either that I'm going to just have to be in a dysfunctional cycle for a while mm-hmm. until I hit this milestone that I get out or whatever it was. And with us, you know, we just put our head down. We just all went to work and, you know, prayed hard and, you know, and just continue to work until we begin to turn some corners. But I really didn't start making any money until about, oh, 10, 15 years ago. Um, I'm 48 now. And let's see, I've been at the bank for almost seven. So, yeah, it's probably been about 11 years ago when I took a job um, with uh, the gentleman I was referring to earlier. I don't want to talk about too much about him because of other confidentiality issues, but he was a mentor of mine. Mm. And he was... Um, uh, he he was, raised you up. Yeah, he raised me up, I would say, by the scruff of the neck. It yeah. was kind of like bear cub, grab me by my neck and, you know, kind of figure it out. P- figure it out. And, um, but he was an excellent teacher. Cool. He was an excellent teacher. Um, but what I saw in his office, and he was an attorney, he was also a CPA, and he was a multimillionaire, and he was, um, <clears throat> That's fortunate that you got to hang out with him. Oh, guy. it was a God thing. It was a real God cool. thing. I mean, it, it was really something that opened up my eyes. And so my first step in financial literacy was realizing that I, one, had none. I mean, that <laughs> well, is go the, to the club. I, mean, I think that everybody is, does not you've have You've got to realize. They don't teach you this. But until you realize, I'm totally clueless. I don't know what I'm doing. You kind of have to hit that bottom. Like, i got to do something different. That's the first thing. The, 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 big, the next biggest question is, okay, and it's, it's, which is harder to answer is what do I do? Mm. And by that time, or how do I do it? Or how do I do it? all the components that go into, and you know, what does it look? I mean, just all, I mean, you're just clueless. And so what I saw in that office were men and women who knew how to do it. Yeah. That's cool. They knew how to do it. I like that. And my job during, you know, most of my day there was to keep track of all to, their money, of all their money. <laughs> I didn't get to manage any of it. Oh, no, no. You just that got was to all. just put it in a spreadsheet. I got to put it on spreadsheets, and I watched it grow, and I got to watch how their Acquisitions? In, uh, acquisitions, stock market, commodities. We were trading by we. I mean, they. I just happened to be an employee. <laughs> like, right? But it was cattle, and it was natural gas, and it was... We were we were selling calls and selling land too. You're telling me about some land deals. Land, you bet. I mean, so it was incredible. And you were managing property for him as well. Yeah, there's about a fifteen million dollar real estate portfolio that he entrusted to me and. uh, what to, an honor. to manage well i say entrusted to me but then you know we met every week and we talked several times during the week and and but i learned so much about that but it was definitely kind of an on-the-job mba working for him yeah absolutely and i'm um, it's groomed you for where and you didn't know at that time that you were going to be this banker well my, my standard joke at the time i may have told told you this but i tell everybody this and for no. those for those of you out there in radio land that are going through a hard time you need to perk up 
<laughs> perk up. Okay, here's the deal. Perky perk. <laughs> Here it is. Everybody's heard the the old you know adage that says what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Oh yeah. Okay. I've heard that. What you haven't heard was until it makes you stronger, you feel like it's killing you. <laughs> That's true. Okay. And so if it, you feel like it's killing you, welcome to the club. Mm. And I think this. I think you got two different. Get two, get two options when you're in that situation, Steve. Either you're gonna bail, give up, or you, or, or you're gonna, or you're gonna dig in. And you know, everybody's favorite fountain of wisdom right now is Facebook. And so on Facebook recently, I saw something that I actually agreed with. You know, fear another an acronym for that is face everything and rise. You know, cool. You can face everything. Cliche. It's a little cliche, but you know, hey, it is. It is Facebook. We can't. We we can't set. It's the all line. truth. Then don't. That's right. Don't ask Facebook to do more than Facebook can do for you. But I like that. I like face. You can either face everything and rise, or you can bail. And so when you're in that kind of a hard situation, you got to just decide if you're going to man up or uh, go home. And so anyway, for me, I didn't have a choice. I would have jumped if I could, but um financially i didn't have an option right so you had the stick and dig in i had the stick I had which to dig taught in. you the, the amazing banker that you are today i mean think about the attributes you know how to do underwriting that you helped. know how to manage property it helped, you know yeah. how to do acquire property mm-hmm. i mean you're an asset in this world a for the bank and for your own self personally all the things that you've learned all right speaking of things literacy is your big thing financial iq we've been 26 minutes into the interview so okay already Okay. But I want to take this. I mean, this is a great conversation. I love our flow. Okay. Um, but a lot of people dip off after 20 minutes is what what's Facebook says about, okay. <laughs> about okay. podcasts okay. in general. So we're going to do a series is what you're telling me. I would love to have you back on <laughs> every week, to be honest. But You want to talk about the weekend? Yeah, I want to talk about what you're going to teach. Uh, I, I've seen you speak at least three or four times. Um, and each time you speak, and, and you know, I know that when I ask you to speak, it's like the same material. But every time you do speak, it's like it brings light in a dark area of financial confusion. And I think that, John, I don't think you understand that, you know, one person in the room may never heard of these terms. And right. then people like me that need to hear it 10 times right. to understand. And I, I love the energy and effort that you put in to speaking. I mean, you've been working on this since I've asked you for a long time now. Give us a perspective or an idea of what you're going to cover on Saturday. Okay. Um, and what I just say is this, I think a lot of one of the big walls between the haves and the have nots Mm -hmm. is knowledge. Amen. The more, you know, you more you make. That's right. And one of the key components to knowledge is the language that's used. True. And so, that's one of the things that I learned when I went to work for that mentor I was telling you about. And, um, I mean, one of the things they were throwing, he was throwing around terms like leverage and liquidity, leverage, liquidity, Acquisition. Cap, capital infusing, you know, cap rate, all, all these types of things. And when I realized is that when I began to understand, Oh, by liquidity, you guys just mean cash. <laughs> well, that's stupid. Why can't you just say cash to begin with? No. And what I think, you know, because I told, I've just shared, you know, we didn't start from a whole lot. And my dad taught me how to do a lot of things. Not grateful for him, but becoming a millionaire is not something that my dad taught me how to do. It's not his driver. That's right. And so, um, you know, when I realized, wait a minute, it's not hard if, to understand the concepts if you know the language. And so what I'm going to be doing some on Saturday with the limited time that we have is I'm going to be talking about financial IQ in terms of two different things in terms of terminology, the language, what does this stuff mean Mm. and how to measure performance specifically related to real estate balance sheet. I'm going to talk a little bit about balance sheet. Now, again, I'm only going to have, how long do I have? Do I have 30 minutes, an hour? We might just go all night with you. Well, everybody would begin to throw things at me if I go much past 30 minutes or an hour. So, but anyway. Don't worry about the time because. But here's the thing. It's valuable. Here's the thing. The, The terminology is important even to the most basic investor, the most beginning investor, as well as the most advanced investor. Because it's the terminology that helps, not just helps you grow, it does, but that's kind of cliche. It helps you enter into conversations with people that are in different areas of finance that you're in. Mm. There is opportunity in those different finances. There is 
reward for all the parties. The more people that enter into that conversation, that enter into those arenas, there's more opportunity for growth, for buying, for selling, for growing, for investment, for personal development, all that kind of stuff. And so the more you know, the, the, the further you can go into those areas. Um, when it comes to my area, as far as banking goes and lending, it's so very important that the, that the investor clients that I work with have the ability to measure how they're doing. Yeah. Well, underwriting, because I mean, so they can go under. That's right. And so here's the thing. If I'm going to loan you half a million dollars, I'm going to want to check back up on that from time to time. Sure. And you don't want to be, I guess it's just convenient, easier for you to, that, for them to send the right documents. It's got to be the right documents. I've got to have a certain degree of confidence that they know what those documents mean. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay. And I've got a certain degree of confidence you know, that the, that the information is right. Like one of the hardest things I had to do was I have a customer that's borrowing right now about a million dollars from me. And this customer's been, you know, this is, by the way, Radio Land, this is not Stephen Van Cowen no. I'm referring to. Because I'm about to but, whip you if it was but me. No, 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 no. But there's but there's an investor of mine that um, has been swearing to me for three years. Oh, we've got this accounting thing locked down. We've got mm. it locked down. You know, I got financial statements that proved to me that not only did his accounting, his, his accountant not know, mm. But that he didn't know, and I, you know, I've actually seen that before, where investors trust a specific accountant, and they're they're, they're not even the right, yeah, document. I mean, they're not even done right. And I, anyway, you know, I mean, Kiyosaki talks about financial intelligence. I yes, mean, I'm a. I mean, I, the, I think you said it right from the beginning. The more you know, the more you make. I mean, you didn't say it like that, but financial literacy is is up there with. I mean, knowing how to bathe. Sure. Yep. So anyway, I all right. So, to... all right. Let's wrap this up. So we're going to go over financial literacy and from the basics all the way up. And you'll be available for Q and A. Absolutely. The end. Will. And then Friday night, are you going to be able to come to the? I'll be there Friday night. Yeah, you're going to have a round table there. I don't know if you know that, but you do now. Thank you, Steve. You're going to have some questions and answer. Um, hey, if for you guys that are going to be coming on Friday, one, if you didn't go to the Investor Weekend last year, you really missed a huge opportunity. I was blown away. You were just an the, attendee. I was just an attendee. Now I did get to sit with Mr. T B. Yeah. You know. Toby Brown. Hopefully he comes around. Right. I hope he comes. We need to let him know. I know. He's okay. gonna, he, he he will be the best dressed man in, yes, the, he in, does dress in, well. in the building. Good good he for is. him. All right, listen, let's not talk about him. Let's just wrap <laughs> this up with what you know, you're this banker, you're looking at yeah. financial statements all day long, you're underwriting probably I mean, a hundred investors on a, on a yearly basis. I don't know even more. I don't know what those numbers are. What advice would you give to that investor that needs to get a loan or they want to, they have 10 loans or what, is there any kind of things that you see on a recurring basis? That's frustrating that we can correct as a real estate investor. That's a great question. You know, um, Ooh, that was me. I think the pause for editing, <laughs> Okay, the best thing that I would say is this. Um, that real estate investor who wants to get a loan from a bank, the biggest struggle that I see is you have investors that are too desperate. Hmm. Never borrow money when you, don't, when you need it. Or don't buy the house just to buy the house. Don't get into a deal because everybody else is buying deals and you just want to get started. If it doesn't fit the metrics that you are committed to, if it doesn't fit Good. the numbers that your mentor or your coach has said, aim for this, don't buy it. Because well you said. add that, you multiply that times three houses or 50 houses. And all you've got is a mess, and no banker wants yeah. to get in with you like that. I, you know, I want to elaborate on that a little bit. I think that's a temptation that I know that I used to deal with, and I still to this day deal with it because, you know, I set a goal this year to, to acquire this many assets. And sometimes I'll, you know, put on a, you know, a house. But I went by that, that house the other day that we were talking about. Oh, yeah, good. And uh, I was like, why am I in this neighborhood? You know, I was a little nervous, uh, and, you know, even though that I'm a hood buyer, right? I, I actually, there was a black party going on, a black party. There was a black party going on. And <laughs> there was a lot of people walking around, a lot of music playing and it wasn't a holiday. <laughs> so it, it wasn't St. Patty's day. 
And it was, uh, it was like, what am I trying to do here? You know, and it really, am I just trying to put on another house so I can say I bought X amount of houses Mm -hmm. or is this really fitting in my new business model, which I've changed. I've been doing this for 20 years in my, you know, low income, high cash flow start out is changed. My business model today is way different. Yeah. And so, but I, I think that's great advice, you know, guys out there, if you are, trying to build bulk up or try to build your, and you just got the green light from your amazing banker. Just really, really, really think about that asset. You're, you're chained to it, your personal guaranteed on it. And, you know, I bought some ones that I should have not bought and thank God that they've worked out well and have held on. But in this climate where the market may change pretty soon, you know, you don't have those stay. finance with me, do you? <laughs> I, they're probably debt free. <laughs> okay, good. Good. One of them was, I had a flood, <laughs> One of them you denied me on. <laughs> I ought to deny. I ought to be denying you some loans. So I can't always. It makes say me yes. hungrier. I'm like, I, gotta, I can't always say yes. To well, you. this one is. I was like, okay, you know, my mentor was like, dude, too much equity, debt equity, refi, refi. So you, I'm like, I'm going over my portfolio. Over, I'm, I'm enough spreadsheet out. Like I'm a poopa spreadsheet. <laughs> and so I'm That's like, so gross. I'm like, okay. So I picked the one. This one's debt free. It's been debt free for a long time. And I, I fill out my application. I send it to Mr. J B B B, and uh, I send it to you, and uh, everything's great. You, you send me, hey, buddy. You hit me with the buddy, and I was like, uh, oh, we're buddies now. Okay, buddy. Every, everybody's my buddy. Everybody's a buddy, and I was like, this is in a flood zone, and uh-huh. uh, you know, you might want to rethink this refinance. And I was like, why? Well, we're not too keen on loading flood properties. But we will, but you're going to have to have super ironclad flood insurance. insurance. Yeah. And I was like, that's a, well, that's a requirement on us. I mean, but that's also talking. double duty on me. That takes t- right now. Let's just say my insurance on that asset. It's only $500 a year. Flood insurance is a thousand. So there goes mm. my another $80 sure. a month or it's, fi- it's $60 a month. Equity. It is I mean, material. Cash flow. it's material. And so what I would do is this. If you're an investor and you're out there and you're looking at it, if you're if you're grinding deals all the time, you're looking at deals. Make sure that somewhere in your process, on the first third of your process, that you know somebody that can can determine whether or not it's in a flood zone, mm-hmm. whether you're using a, a realtor, whether it's a if a, you're working with the wholesale group that has the ability to pull flood certifications from FEMA, whether it's your banker, whatever it is, you got to find a way mm-hmm. to get that done because. It is not a small number. Well, an easy way to do it, but I learned a lot that way. That was buying the wrong property, but you can go to FEMA website and, and search up for flood zones. Do you know that website, Steve? It's FEMA. Just... just Google up flood zone FEMA, Oklahoma, or whatever state you're in. It's free public knowledge. Now, to get right. a certificate, no, you got to pay the 15 bucks. Well, you don't. You just need to know. You just need no. to know. And, I, and actually, I was help coaching a, an investor the other day. He was like, man, this is a deal. And then I was like, let me look, see if it's in a flood zone. Boom. Sure enough, it was in a flood zone. I'm like, bro, you can't buy this. And he was all disenchanted with me. And I was like, yeah. this is why I'm helping you because don't be where I am. Because I bought that property with cash 10 years ago and didn't realize <laughs> that it was in a flood zone because I paid cash. Right. And so, boom, I can't refinance and stick with all this equity sitting there. It looks mm. great on my balance sheet to you. Sure. Oh, yeah. Debt free asset. Oh, Van Kalenberg, he's got it going on. No, I don't because that's cash. Just sitting there doing nothing. Sure. But anyway, that's what I've learned and learned a lot from you. And I really appreciate our relationship and ultimately our friendship. And I'd love to see you grow as a banker and from vice president all the way up to a senior vice president, which is like, or vice, whatever the freak you are. I'm a senior vice president. So you're right next to the president. I'm right next to the president. So you guys are elbows. Bing, bing. That's right. Anyway, uh, I don't really care, but I, I do I care as a person I'm that you're happy the, and I'm happy because you loan me money and well, we're all friends in that well, realm. To, you know, And you have denied me before more than once, but let's not get into that right now. But let's get into how could someone, not your cell phone number, which I'll give it out if you call me, pay me, but no, I'm just joking. <laughs> if, if an email that someone could ask you a question or connect with you, there's another banker out there that may have been the same road that you've gone on. Yeah, you bet. Okay, so this is this is my reality. My reality is is a great reality. It's just painful for me is that I've got far more business right now than I can manage personally. So I have a fantastic assistant who leverages my time 
And so if you're interested in pursuing a loan program with us or just learning a little bit more about our program, I would encourage you to email my assistant. And I'll be giving this information out again on Saturday at Investor Weekend. Again, make sure you get your ticket for Investor Weekend. It's going to be mm-hmm. awesome. But um, my assistant's name is Chris Gordon. And it's uh, regular Chris with a C, C H R I S, Gordon, G O R D O N, as in commissioner, Gordon. Okay. For, for the Batman fans. Um, at. <laughs> at FSB, for this is for First Security Bank. So it's FSBOKC.com. And what you want to do is you want to ask for the starter pack. Cool, for real estate investors. Yeah, he'll know exactly what that is. Ask for the starter pack, and he will immediately reply or close to immediately reply with an email. They'll give you some information about our program, some information for underwriting if you choose to go down that road. Cool. Um, and so, Or if they want to get a hold of you, you get another a colleague of your stature may... May I know that you've spoke all over the place and in Colorado. Yeah. You can still get through uh, John's assistant and communicate through that way and build the relationships. Yeah, yeah. Phone number at the bank. Oh, I'm online, but but the phone number on the, my phone number at the bank is uh, area code four zero five four two four four three four one. Yes, folks. Four zero five four three four four two four rather four three four one. All right, shut. Up. Uh, all right. So anyway, I'm excited. Investor Weekend, get your ticket. InvestorWeekend.com. I N F whatever. Investor spell it. Weekend.com. You get to meet the great John Day. Stop it. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a pleasure. Thanks for coming in. We'll have you back on the Savvy Radio Show soon enough. Thank Investor so Weekend is not far off. With over 10 information sessions to increase your portfolio, log on to www.investorweekend.com. Whether you are a seasoned investor or never purchased a property before, you don't want to miss the Investor Weekend. Join us for a powerful, knowledge-packed weekend with over 10 informational sessions that are bound to enlarge your real estate investments. You will hear from the best national and local real estate investors that will share practical and relevant experiences with you, the investor. There will be several networking sessions to connect with other like-minded people for potential funding, partnerships, and yes, hot deals. Go to www.investorweekend.com. Did you know we meet once a month for the Landlord Lunch Meeting? The third Wednesday of every month, go to landlordlunch.com. Thanks for listening to the Savvy Radio Show. Glide online and listen to our other motivating episodes at SavvyRadioShow.com. Connect on Twitter at LandlordBook and always be buying assets. 